welcome to Pure Dog Talk. I am your host, Laura Reeves. And as always, I am very, very excited to have my friend, Dr. Marty Greer here. And we are going to talk about something we have not touched on previously in our veterinary voice conversations, which is, which is saying something because Marty, you and I have covered a lot of territory here. (laughs) We have. So, but tonight we're going to talk about kidney diseases and ailments and things that can go wrong with our dogs from random to specific. So I'm very excited about this conversation as almost always most of our veterinary voice topics are things that I personally have experienced in a dog in my care and this is no exception. So (laughs) welcome to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we have managed to cover a lot of ground, sometimes not even on purpose. Not a, it, like squirrel. What are you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So talk to us about kidneys. They're an important item yeah. in our dogs. They really are. You're supposed to have two. All of us are supposed to have two. Um, and they're supposed to both work effectively. But it doesn't always go that way. And a lot of people take kidneys for granted because they you know, they've heard, well, you can donate a kidney, so you must not really need to have two kidneys. And, you know, as much as I love most of my family, other than a family member, I would not give up a kidney because you really do need the reserve of an extra kidney in case something goes wrong with one or both. Um, Just like your liver, just like almost all of our organs, they're duplicated. So we should have two and they should both work effectively. So we need to take good care of our kidneys and that of our dogs. So super important we do that. And there's a long list. I started typing out a list of all the things that can go wrong. And it's a really long list. And then the diagnostic. Like top five most common. I mean, I don't, you know, I think that'll probably take our full time. (laughs) Yeah, we can do the the most common. Um, The first thing we always think of in dogs in our practice is leptospirosis. And secondly, is Lyme disease, because we see those two infections frequently causing kidney problems, which are related to an infection in the kidneys and glomerulonephritis, which is inflammation of the cells inside the kidney. Um, So those are really important. Um, Age is also a really important category. So we'll talk about infectious diseases, age, inherited diseases, toxins, and pre-renal failure or um, other causes that cause blood pressure to go down and kidney failure, kidney function to fail. So then there's another list of other things that we need to talk about, but things like Fanconi syndrome and leishmaniasis, not common. So we're not going to spend much time on those. But toxins, very important. Antifreeze in cats, um, don't want to leave the cats out, lilies, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, aminoglycoside antibiotics. So there's a lot of toxic, and we, and we use drugs sometimes that are toxic to the kidneys, even deliberately, knowing that we have to be really careful with them. So those are kind of the, the common things. A lot of older dogs end up with kidney disease, and a lot of older cats do too. But this is a dog program, so I don't want to delve into cats too much. But well, if, we if, see... Give cats a little minute. I mean, cats can... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we don't want to leave the cats out, but a cat in kidney failure will live two or three, maybe four years. A dog in kidney failure, a dog in kidney failure, a much shorter time period. So I want to really clearly describe the difference between those and that, you know, if you go in your cat's BUN is a little high and the urine specific gravity is a little low, you know, you take good care of that cat, it's going to live four more years. You go in with a dog with the same situation, they are circling the drain pretty fast unless you are really on it with a veterinary clinic that is into finding the underlying problem and managing it well. Um, And sometimes even under the best of circumstances, it doesn't go well in dogs. So let's start with, let's start with, before we go into any of the various things, how do I know my dog is having a problem with its kidneys? What am I seeing? Sure. The symptoms that most people catch first are a change in water consumption, an increase in water consumption, and an increase in urination. Now, that's not the only reason that dogs can drink more, need to drink more and urinate more. And what goes in must come out. So remember, if your dog is drinking more, it's likely urinating more. And if your dog is urinating more, it's probably because it's drinking more. So those usually go hand in hand. 
but I sometimes am surprised by the answers I get from clients when they are asked these questions and they, they don't give a good answer. And sometimes the dog is drinking more and they're urinating someplace that the owner just hasn't found yet. So they may have an indoor bathroom that's secret to you, but not secret to them. Um, so sometimes that happens. So the most common thing are changes in water consumption, changes in urination. Now, other things that frequently cause that are going to be diabetes, which happens in dogs and cats, mm -hmm. Cushing's disease, which happens in dogs, which is an adrenal gland dysfunction, um, and other things like pyometra, um, high calcium that can be related to a form of different forms of cancer. So there can be other things that we're looking for, but we're going to start looking at kidneys, diabetes, and Cushing's disease in the dog most commonly. Um, and so you're basically going to go in, tell the vet that your dog is drinking too much, urinating too much, and we're going to get blood work and a urinalysis as our basic starting point. But that's not the only place we're going to go. We're going to start with those two things. Because if the dog is still able to concentrate their urine well, then that tells us something different than if the dog's urine was really dilute. And if the BUN and creatinine start to go up, once that happens, that means that only one-fourth, only 25% of the dog's kidneys are still working correctly unless it's a secondary cause from dehydration like vomiting, diarrhea, other causes of dehydration. So super important that you go in, you, you, and, and if your vet says we should do lab work, you shake your head up and down and you say yes. Yes, please. Yes, we should. Lab. Yes, please. Do not argue with them. Do not fight them on it because you can very quickly tell from a urinalysis and a blood panel, is my dog diabetic? Does my dog have a pyometra? Does my dog have Lyme disease, leptospirosis, high calcium, some form of cancer? Um, some other form of dehydration or one of the other multitudes of things. So shake your head up and down and please, please, please take your dog in with a full bladder and let your veterinarian collect a urine sample there. We have lots of clients that volunteer to bring urine samples, but the problem with those are they're not usually sterile. They're usually not very well collected. They're oftentimes not really fresh. So trot in with your dog without letting him urinate between the car and the veterinary clinic. Mm -hmm. And in our practice, when we know a dog is coming in for a urinalysis, we do it by cystocentesis, which means we look at the bladder on ultrasound, we put a needle directly in it, it kind of freaks people out. It doesn't bother the dogs or the cats one little bit. They just lay on the table like, oh, this is cool. Now, if they were putting a needle into your bladder, you'd probably freak out a little bit just I would because of the thought of it. You know, yeah. yeah, but it doesn't hurt. If it hurt, dogs and cats wouldn't just lay there and look at us blankly like, oh, okay. So um, make sure that you let them get a urine sample and get it collected. It's sterile that way. It's fresh. And urine sample over time, not only does the bacteria change in it, but the kind of crystals change. And so a whole lot of things change. So if you collected it the night before, put it in your refrigerator and then took it into the vet clinic in the morning, you're going to get a whole different result. So if your vet says, I would like to ultrasound your dog's bladder and collect a urine sample, along with saying yes to the blood samples, say yes to the urinalysis, because the ur urinalysis, the UA in hand in hand with the blood sample tells us a whole lot more mm -hmm. than either one alone. So collaboratively, they tell us a bunch. Now, if they come back high BUN, high creatinine, high SDK, right. then so we'll this chase is what it down. I was going to do, I was going to interrupt you just for a second, Marty, and have you explain what is BUN. I, like, I've looked at an awful lot of CBCs and chemistry panels, but not everybody has. What's a what's a BUN? What's a chemist? Uh, what's a creatinine? Creat creatinine? Am I yeah, creat. Mm -hmm. creat. Yep. And then talk to us about specific gravity and what that means. Those seem to be the three sure. top things on kidneys. Yeah, and we'll throw another one in there too, a couple more. So BUN stands for blood urea nitrogen. That is one of the two waste products that we should see eliminated through the kidneys if the kidneys are working correctly. Creatinine and BUN typically go up parallel. So when those go up, that tells us that there's something wrong with the kidneys. Either it's renal, so meaning kidney in origin, pre-renal, meaning that the dog is dehydrated and therefore is um, seeing those waste products go up because the dog isn't able to flush them out of the system by drinking enough, like vomiting, like diarrhea, like pyometra, like a lot of other things, or post-renal, meaning that the dog is obstructed. Now, heaven help us that we don't know that the dog is obstructed and unable to urinate. And I do mean urinary obstruction, not bowel obstruction. So those are the three. So we classify them renal, pre-renal, and post-renal. That's and where we start we with did, We just did, like two months ago, we did kidney stones. 
So anybody yep. that's that's worried about obstruction and kidney stones, there's a podcast for that. There's a podcast yep. for almost everything. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so go look it up. So go find that one and listen to that one on kidney stones. But okay, sure. so BUN, creatinine, and then specific gravity. Talk to that one. Well, let's let's SDMA first, and then oh, we'll come okay. back to specific gravity. So okay. SDMA is a test that has been developed by IDEX that is a predictor of kidney disease before the BUN and creatinine start to go up. So it's pretty interesting. The BUN and creatinine don't go up until the dog is living on 25% of their kidney function. Wow. SDMA goes up before that. So it's predictive except in puppies. It's always high in puppies. So if you go in and your dog has a blood panel done before their spay or neuter or whatever surgery they're gonna have, and your vet comes in and says, oh, the SDMA is high. If it's a puppy, it's not accurate. Below and even I, yeah, yeah, below 12 months. Even IDEX doesn't have a great explanation for it, but just be aware, do not freak out that your dog's in renal failure if the SDMA is high and it's like five months old, just relax. Okay, your analysis tells us a lot of things, we look at chemistries on the urinalysis, mostly we look at specific gravity and chemistries. And the specific gravity is the ability of the kidney to concentrate urine. Once the kidney is damaged at 66%, so only 33% of it's continuing to work, then the kidney can no longer concentrate urine, so the specific gravity becomes isosthenuric. Um, isosthenuric means between 1.008 and 1.012, that's isosthenuria. So that tells us that the kidneys can't concentrate the urine. So that's an earlier predictor that there's kidney problems, not as early as SDMA, but earlier than BUN and creatinine. Now, if your dog eats a lot of canned food, eats a raw diet, if your cat eats canned food, that can sometimes be less accurate. But if you're you know, looking at a fasting blood sample and a urine sample first in the morning, it should be pretty well concentrated. It should be above 1012, probably above 1020 in a dog, and yes, above 1030 in a cat. That's just normal. So if I have an old cat that comes in or an old dog that comes in and they're 1020, but their BUN and creatinine are still okay, I'm still going to be talking about you, uh, you know, starting to change diet, make sure that the dog has access to plenty of water. You never deprive it of water so it becomes dehydrated and then further accelerates the kidney problem. So those are all bits and pieces that you need to know. So we're not trying to talk a weird language or confuse anybody. It's just right. when you have just 24 chemistry panels. Those, those are like really important things that you're going to look for if it's a kidney thing. Yes. And that the, yes. that's going to hand you that piece of paper and it's going to look like it's written in Greek. And those are the three things that you can look for. Right. Right. And your vet is going to look at this and interpret it fairly quickly. You're going to be scrutinizing it and trying to understand every word. But, you know, after you've looked at UAs and, and CBC chemistries for as many years as your veterinarians have, they basically can just glance down the paper and go, oh, okay, here's a problem. So that's where we start. So your analysis, in addition to the specific gravity, we can look at chemistries on there. So we can look at the protein, the glucose, the ketones, the bilirubin. Um, there's a whole bunch of nuances to that. And if there's too much protein in the urine and it's fairly concentrated, then the next test we're going to do on that is going to be a urine protein creatinine ratio, UPCR, because that tells us how much protein is leaking through the kidneys. And if there's protein leaking into the kidneys and into the urine, that's bad, but it can be managed if you catch that early. So again, this is an earlier indicator of kidney problems that allow us to jump in and start making some modifications in the dog's diet, medications, some other things that we can do that can really effectively help prolong that dog or cat's life expectancy. So very cool on that. Then also on the urinalysis, we look under the microscope and we look for white blood cells, red blood cells, crystals, um, casts. A cast is a cellular piece of material that tells us that there's actually active damage happening in the kidneys. It's the tubules sloughing cells, that's bad. Crystals go along with our are um, stones that we talked about last time, so we're not gonna go into that. And red blood cells, white blood cells, and bacteria will tell us if there's an infection, what kind of an infection it is, um, and those kinds of things. So we can see bladder infections and we can see kidney infections. And a lot of people confuse those because they think it's all part of the same system. Bladder infections, dogs and cats don't get sick. They may be uncomfortable, they may urinate frequently, they may have blood in their urine, they're not sick. If they come in with 
white blood cells in their urine and they're sick, they're running a fever, they're, they're ill, they're not eating well, that's a probable infection in the kidneys called pyelonephritis. Very bad, not nearly as common as bladder infections, but you got to jump on those and get them treated before there's permanent damage to the kidneys. So it's really important that we get an accurate and sterile urine sample so we can test for this stuff. We are at the Kentuckiana Cluster of Dog Shows, and I'm talking to Dr. Karen Potter. She is a German wire hair pointer breeder, a Trupanion breeder, and she's also a veterinarian. And Karen's going to talk about what Trupanion means to her as a breeder, and also what it means for her as a veterinarian. When I became a Trupanion breeder, and I sent my litters out, I knew that they were going with 30 days of coverage had one of my owners have an emergency with them. That's comforting to me as a breeder to know that they can get help. As a veterinarian, there are many cases where we have to make decisions on how to treat things based on financial restraints. And when the financial restraints come into play, we can't always do absolutely everything for that pet. So if my puppies are covered, at least for those first 30 days, I know that if they get sick, they can get the best possible care. So um, I, I, you can see me going, I, yeah, yeah, I have questions. Um, I know. <laughs> it's all over. My hand language. Um, okay. Can a bladder infection go to the kidneys, number one? Is it can. A- it's not common, but it can. Okay. Okay, so more commonly, you- more commonly, you'd see pus in the urine from the kidneys, not the other way around. Okay, so what's going to cause a kidney infection? Where's our causation? It's usually hematogenous, meaning it starts off in the bloodstream. Mm-hmm. So it can start as a pyometra, it can start as any way the bacteria get into the bloodstream. Uh, but usually the kidneys are protected by the fact that the urine is concentrated, so that helps to kill bacteria. And remember, urine is flowing from the kidneys down the ureters and into the bladder. So that constant flushing should keep bacteria from being able to ascend up into the ureter and up into the kidney. So can they still happen? Yes, they can. They're not at all common, but they happen. And they're tricky to diagnose because sometimes they just it doesn't look obvious. So that's where um, that blood and the urine sample is really important because it is life-saving to a dog. Um, or cat to have that diagnosed and and be able to resolve that. So that's that's where we're going to go with that. Now, if there's pus in the urine, whether it's from the bladder or the kidneys, we're going to want to culture it, find out which bacteria is living there, what antibiotic is going to be most effective. And if it's a bladder infection, we'll typically treat for, you know, the very first bladder infection, maybe three to five days. After that, typically 14 days. If it's pyelonephritis, a kidney infection, that dog is going to be on antibiotics for a minimum of four weeks, absolute minimum. So the other infections, like we kind of mentioned at the beginning, that can cause kidney damage, don't necessarily, leptospirosis actually lives in the kidney. Lyme disease does not live in the kidney. Lyme disease can live in other parts of the body. But any of those infections can set up glomerulonephritis, which is this big, you know, giant word, but basically it's inflammation of the cells of the kidney. And oftentimes proteins are getting uh, produced in this whole thing and they start clogging up the tubules in the kidney and causing some really serious damage. So that's where Lyme nephritis, Lyme disease causing kidney failure comes in is it's glomerulonephritis, not the bacteria itself, but the inflammatory changes that happen with it. Leptospirosis are bacteria that actually live in the kidneys And those, again, are very serious. And we see several cases of lepto a year in our practice. You can vaccinate for Lyme disease. You can vaccinate for lepto. If you live in Utah, you probably don't need it. It's dry. They don't have a lot of lepto. They don't have a lot of Lyme. If you live in other parts of the country, listen to your veterinarian, especially if you're new to that part of the country or you travel there for that's where you spend the winter or you go there for dog shows a lot. Listen to the local veterinarians because they know what infections, what diseases that they see and they're going to help you decide what vaccinations and what preventives you should use to try and manage some of these things to keep your dog's kidneys healthy. Okay. Okay. So I'm, I've got a dog that has been consistently, um, my old vet called it PUPD. So I know there's yep. a special name for that. Drink too much, pee too much. Um, and you see this and you're like, something's not quite right, but 
you know, mostly they're fine. They're running around, whatever. And then one day dog decides, I'm going to try and die. And I have 105 temperature and blah, blah, blah. And so you take your dog to the veterinarian, you pull your blood panel, you pull your urinalysis, you look at what your antibiotics are, then where are we going from there? Well, the, we're going to want to culture the urine. Right. We're going to want to get the dog on fluids. Okay. Um, we're going to want that urine protein creatinine ratio to see if there's leaking of the protein, whether we need to put the dog on blood pressure medications or other drugs to keep the protein from leaking. Okay. Um, we're going to want to use the appropriate antibiotic. They're, if they're in kidney failure and they're running a fever, they're going on IV fluids, man. Um, Sub-Q fluids are fine for little things, you know, maybe a little vomiting, maybe a little diarrhea. If your dog's in kidney failure, they need to be in the hospital on IV fluids. A lot of people will prefer 24-hour-a-day hospitals, but sometimes those are hard to get into or um, difficult to be able to afford. So at least, I mean, what we do in our practice is we'll put in an IV catheter and really hit the dog hard with fluids during the 8 to 10 hours that we're open and then send him home at night with the catheter and come back the next day. It takes a minimum of three to four days of heavy-duty IV fluids diuresing the patient before we can see any kind of a change in the kidney values. And this is where it, it comes with a lot of experiences that, you know, when you're a new veterinarian, you start the dog on fluids and you're like, okay, we're going to check the blood every 12 hours or every 24 hours. We're going to see how that's going. I never see that BUN and creatinine start to drop for the first 72 hours. And all you do if you run blood work is you run up a bill and then you get more and more discouraged that the dog is not going to improve because the BUN and creatinine don't move for 72 hours. And then when it moves, it's either going to move miraculously down, like plummet, or all that fluid is going to start filling up the dog's legs and body cavities and you're going to be like, yeah. So no matter how good the numbers look at three days, if the dog looks terrible, the dog's not getting better. That's not a good situation. So it takes a minimum of three days on heavy duty IV fluids and antibiotics to get these guys to turn around. And if you don't have the resources to do three days of treatment, it's just going to be a losing proposition. And it's expensive, but it and it's it's difficult and it's painful to watch your dog go through this. But it's it's kind of it's kind of tough. It's kind of the way it is. So. Um, additional diagnostics, you're going to want to test the dog for lepto. Now there's a PCR test which looks for the bacteria in the urine. That has to be done before the antibiotics are started. And then a titer test. Now the titer will tell us if it's a rising titer, but it can take three weeks for the titer on a leptospirosis dog to start to go up. So we usually do both the PCR and titer because we don't want to wait three weeks to start treatment if it's lepto. If it's Lyme disease, we're going to do that SNAP40X or the other equivalent Lyme tests. And if that comes back positive, we're probably going to want to do a C6 to see if that dog has an active Lyme infection or an old Lyme infection. Because once the SNAP test turns positive on Lyme disease, that will stay positive for years. Maybe not the dog's whole life, right. but a pretty long time. Yeah. So without a C6, you don't know if it's an active infection or an old infection. We lost three dogs last year to Lyme disease in our practice. One of them had a, a C6 of over 800. So it's dramatically high. Anything below 30 wow. is not an active infection. Above 30, it is an active infection. But at 836, it's pretty bad. That's bad. So you want to know, yeah, you want to know the Lyme results, the lepto results, the urine culture results, the urine protein creatinine ratio. Um, so those are all important things. You want to make sure that there's no underlying disease going on. Does the dog have a pyometra? Does the dog have endocarditis and there's, they're throwing bacteria in the bloodstream because of a heart problem? You know, what other underlying problems are going on? Do they have Cushing's disease? Because Cushing's disease causes them to, the dogs to drink a lot and urinate a lot. That's the PUPD, polyuria, polydipsia. Polyuria means many urine, so a lot, urinating a lot. Polydipsia means drinking a lot. So those are, you know, words that we throw around in veterinary medicine because PUPD is easier to say than all That's the other my vet things that go with it. said it to me, I'm sure, because I can't say all those other words. <laughs> no, it gets complicated. So you're going to want to look for underlying problems. So those are all the things. We're probably going to want to talk about an ultrasound. Is the kidney looking normal on the ultrasound? Does the dog have a congenital kidney problem? There's polycystic kidney disease. There's renal dysplasia there's hydronephrosis, there's all these things that we can see on ultrasound. I had a dog that came into the practice this weekend to be bred and I did her pre-breeding exam and I felt her abdomen 
and I could feel this big structure in her abdomen. And I'm like, okay, this isn't supposed That's to be here. So I put her, on, put her on the table, did an ultrasound, said, okay, this isn't supposed to be here. Put her on the x-ray table, took an x-ray, said, this isn't supposed to be here. She probably has a hydronephrotic kidney. Hydronephrosis means this huge amount of fluid had built up in the kidney. Mm -hmm. So she had basically one functioning kidney and one kidney that wasn't functioning. So that's why you really want to have two. Um, so all those mm -hmm. things, we're going to look for underlying problems to find out, does the dog have renal amyloidosis, which we can see in certain breeds like Sharpays and Chows. So we're going to be looking for things. Does she have kidney failure? Does she have kidney kidney cancer? You know, does she have cancer somewhere else, like an anal sac or a lymph nodes that's causing the calcium level to go high and it reflects as a high calcium in the blood, but increased water consumption, increased urination, PUPD, because the dog is trying to flush that calcium level out because the kidneys will start to build up calcium and calcium in your kidneys turns them into little rocks and they don't function very well. So there's there's lots of nuances to this. It's not just you walk in and say, okay, your dog has kidney failure. It's just an old dog. Don't worry about it. There's nothing else we can do. It's going to die. Um, we've had dogs come to our practice like that and we will chase it down and find out, well, you know what? Your dog has lepto and if we treat the lepto, mm -hmm. your dog's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. We take care of a whippet that came to us four years ago on Halloween night. And um, she, she, he was diagnosed as, oh yeah, he's three years old, but he's in kidney failure. He's going to die in the next three weeks. Well, that was four years ago because we found the lepto, treated the lepto, and the dog is fantastic. You ever see a fat whippet? I have a fat Very, whippet. very. I, 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 I have, but it's not common. <laughs> no, he eats KD because that's good for his yeah. kidneys. And right. that made him fat, which is really fun to see a fat whippet that was supposed to be dead three and a half years ago. It's pretty right. fun. So all those uh, things are important. So talk a little bit. There are any number of, I hate to, you know, go too far down this rabbit hole that some of you mentioned Cushing, some of the more common breed specific kidney disorders, Fancona, you mentioned earlier, which is Basenji's. Right. Um, and, right. And pops up, I think a few other places. What are some of the other things that people should put in a differential on this? Um, polycystic kidney disease, pretty common in the Shih Tzus, the Lhasas, some of those breeds. Um, it's common in certain breeds of cats as well, like Persians. Um, renal dysplasia, again, that's an inherited disorder that we can see. I've seen it in all breeds, so you can't specifically. I've seen it in Newfoundland's Schnauzers. You know, you can't really classify it too hard and fast as just one. Um, but on ultrasound, you can generally tell if the dog has polycystic kidney disease or renal dysplasia. So those are pretty important things. Hydro hydronephrosis, of course, shows up pretty readily on ultrasound. It looks like a big pocket of fluid, like the dog has two bladders, but it's not supposed to. They're only supposed to come with one. Um, only one renal one amyloidosis. One. Yeah. Usually that's the Sharpays, the, the, um, the chows. Um, oh, the other thing we didn't talk about that can cause, um, kidney failure is a, a stone in the ureter or in the kidney itself, instead of being in the bladder. Again, you hear kidney stones in people fairly often. We don't see them in dogs and cats uh, often at all. Um, they probably exist. We can sometimes see them on x-ray, but they are not nearly as common in dogs and cats as they are reported to be in people. So those are all, I think, important things to know. And there's, I, I do want to make sure that we mention the IVIS website um, or the IRIS website. It's the International Renal Information Society, IRIS, like the flower, mm -hmm. like the flower. And that's a great website for veterinarians and for clients. It has um, classifications of kidney failure, stage 1A, stage 1B, stage 1, 2A, 2B. So you can kind of follow the playbook with your veterinarian. There's a nice little compact guide that puts it all onto one page, but it goes into a lot of detail as well, is when your dog's BUN gets to this level and the specific gravity is this and the protein in the urine is this, that this is what you do for medication, this is what you do for diet, this is what you do for fluids. So it's basically the playbook that's pretty universally um, been accepted by most veterinarians because it was written by a bunch of veterinary experts that do renal failure. Right. You know, all the nephrologists got together and said, okay, this is how we think we should manage these cases. So it's really helpful for you to read through that. So you're educating yourself and you're going into the vet and maybe you take the little pocket guide in and say, so I have this, uh -huh. um, can you help me understand? Like, am I here now and what do, what do we do next? 
Um, and we'll see sometimes dogs that do live several years with kidney failure if they're diagnosed early, managed well, and you're lucky that the dog has the reserves to do it and you can afford it um, because it, it is a little more expensive to buy prescription food. It is um, not terribly expensive for most of the medications that we use. So if we use um, benazapril and allopril, um, any of those to reduce the amount of protein loss in the kidneys, those are very inexpensive medications. Um, the last middle-sized, moderate-sized dog I put on telemasartan, it was $16 for a month's worth. Oh, wow. um, so it's not, it's not terribly expensive. So you can very effectively manage these guys. Um, so super, super important that people know that if they do some checking on prescriptions and, and are careful with how they spend their money on their food and their, their medications, that they can actually do a pretty good job with these guys. Excellent. Okay. Well, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your time on a complicated and sort of deep topic that's hard to sort of pigeonhole. So um, I, I really appreciate it. And I think that there's an awful lot of us out there that have you to thank for the health and well-being of our dogs. True. true, <laughs> true. So. Well, thanks. The one other thing I do want to briefly mention is if the BUN is high and the creatinine is not, it may be because your dog is eating a lot of meat, a raw meat diet in particular. So make sure you're honest with your veterinarians about what you're feeding. And if your veterinarian says, I think you need to do a diet change, again, you need to shake your head up and down because they did some really important work at the University of Minnesota a couple of years ago, a number of years ago, where they compared dogs on regular dog food and prescription dog food for kidney failure. And they were going to do a two-year study on these dogs. So they had people bring in the bag of dog food that they were feeding, and they mixed it all together in a hopper. Half of the dogs went out the door with a mixture of over-the-counter dog food. Half the dogs went out the door with Hill's KD diet. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the first 12 months of the study, they were going to go for two years. They called the study off because so many more dogs were alive on the KD than on the over-the-counter dog food that they considered it to be immoral and unethical to continue the study. So they called it at a year. So please listen to your veterinarians, manage their diet, manage their medications, do what they ask you to do because you can get much better longevity if you do this with your head up and down and agree and don't continue to feed the other food or the raw meat diet or whatever else you're feeding or fail, fail to give medication because you don't believe in medication. I don't know how you, it's not a religion people. It's, it's not a religion. It's shocking, but true. <laughs> uh, and and so one final point, and I think you've alluded to this, but I really want to underline it. Having <laughs> made my own special diet for a pug that was in kidney failure. <laughs> um, so having lived through this, kidney problems, low protein, right? Yes. Not high protein, low protein. Super yes. protein. Yes. So the snacks, the treats need to be few and far between, but not chicken, not cheese, not sausage. Um, watch the sodium, you know, be careful with that stuff. Um, if you insist on giving snacks, give something that is approved by your veterinarian or the prescription diet companies because they do make lists of things. Carrots. So it should be things like carrots yeah, are great. Like carrots. Yeah, carrots, Cheerios, you know, stuff like that not grapes and raisins. That's really bad for their kidneys. So avoid those just to say. Well, and I mean, there's a whole topic we can do on renal failure from consuming grapes and raisins, but that's like a whole nother thing. <laughs> yes. And I think they're getting closer to figuring out the specifics of that. So uh, I think we need to keep an eye on that because I think there's some newer information that will be coming soon. Oh, cool. Well, as soon as it exists, Marty will tell me and we will bring it to you guys. <laughs> there you go. We'll be on it. Awesome. As always. Well, Marty, thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. Listeners, Marty and I have finally made our way to YouTube. So if you want to uh, <laughs> enjoy all of the, the benefit of the podcast with all of our silly facial expressions, by all means, stop <laughs> by YouTube and see my cluttered desk and Marty's cool couch. So. <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot, Marty.
Bye.